2018, after finishing two short episodes of the series Hope from Iran, I was confronted with the challenge of finding new stories for the third and final film. Both characters had to be from Iran, and their stories have to have some sort of connection. I was not sure what would that be. When I first called Habib Zagarpour for a conversation about the film, he immediately agreed to be part of the project. I gotta videotape this. Since he is a special effects wizard and worked with the likes of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, and on top of everything else has two Oscar nominations, I had to come up with a parallel story that was as interesting and challenging at the same time. That's when I met Dr. Adrian Ashragi from the University of Miami. Really never thought these two random stories would have anything in common apart from them being two Iranian Baha'is who left the country right after the revolution. Dr. Shragi is an accomplished surgeon and runs a lab that does advanced studies on cochlear implants for people who are deaf. The medical science and technology are advancing. One can expect that in the near future, we can have more surgical tools and more devices that can help us to restore various human sense. Cochlear implant and the surgery of the, this device allows for the first time to restore one of the human sense, the sense of hearing. Someone who's completely deaf, who became deaf, can again hear or can hear for the first time if, if the person is born deaf. For people with disabilities, getting one of their senses back is a dream come true. For small children, it's a whole new world of opportunities. Adrian was born in Tehran, Iran, and had to leave the country in 1979, right after the revolution. The school was closed, and because his family was Baha'i, it became clear that he would not be free to continue his studies inside the country. While Adrian left Iran to go to Paris, Habib made his way to southern France, more or less during the same period of time. Most definitely, both left the country fearing religious persecution. I was born in Iran, and um, my parents were, were Baha'is, and I, was, I grew up in many countries. That first time when I moved out was difficult. That was the first time I had to cut ties with my friends. After that, it got easier, and then I started really appreciating seeing more of the world. So at a young age, I, I found out, actually when I was 13, I remember, I wanted to be a product designer. I, I felt like I could be technical as well as artistic at the same time, uh, but the systems are very built towards putting you in one box or the other, and I always had to fight, struggle against that, you know, and, and it was difficult to say, I'm an artist, but I can also be an engineer, and uh, I always looked up to Leonardo da Vinci as an idol. Uh, but the system makes it difficult for you to do both. I found out about Art Center College of Design while I was going to UBC in engineering program. So I applied to Art Center and then uh, got a thick letter back. Through that school I was able to meet instructors that were teaching us about design for film. That got me super interested in doing uh, that kind of design. Uh, because you had the freedom of making it science fiction or depending on the project, you could you know, really use your imagination. That became my entry into the visual effects world and then subsequently worked on IMAX for two years on IMAX films in, in LA and then I got accepted to Industrial Light and Magic, George Lucas's company uh, that he'd built to do Star Wars. And so that was my next huge break. 
the masks we wear. The first project I worked on was The Mask with Jim Carrey. I was responsible for all the shots that, where he pulls the mask off his face or the mask gets uh, snapped back on his face. I worked on some of those. Uh, a couple of the Milo dog shots with the mask. And uh, it, it had to have this green gas come off when the mask would, would go on or come off. And uh, that involved particle effects. That, was, that became my specialty. That led to other things like Twister, doing particles for the tornadoes, and then uh, the waters in Perfect Storm, the oceans. After listening to Habib and Adrian's story, it became clear to me how the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran is taking a toll on the country. Depriving the Iranian society of some of their greatest minds some of their greatest talents. So once we look at the, the time I was doing my medical school and now, so much progress happened. You know, internet, uh, computer, uh, teaching uh, over Skype. Medical student doesn't go anymore every day to the classroom like before. We are going to new to knowledge is so easy to everyone. They already have access to all of the books, all of the publications to the internet the night before. The science is open to everyone. As a physician, as a surgeon, there is no room for mediocrity. You have always to have this quality of compassion. People usually say, oh, this person is blind, and they have pity for him, or they are sorry for him. But when somebody is deaf, they joke about him. That shows how challenging it is to be deaf. What makes us as a human being is our communication. When I was in Miami, I had the experience of meeting Betseba, Denise, and Sophia. A whole family whose lives were changed by Dr. Ishragi's expertise. A mother and a daughter who were completely deaf had the chance to hear for the first time after their surgery. Hello, give me five. Hello. <laughs> when we first came here, I came with her, who was having surgery. And actually, Dr. Shiragi, he said, you know, why she's not in the program. So he waited for us to be registered and get all the documentation. And I really appreciate it. I tell a story everywhere. Thank you. No, no, thank, thank you. you. Your friends? Yes. <laughs> Good. A few weeks after the cochlear implant, Sophia went back to the hospital for the first tuning of her device. Once back home, a magical moment unfolds for the child and the family. Sophia's story made me think of how many people inside Iran would benefit from these technologies, how many people whose lives would be totally transformed if students were free to continue their research without artificial obstacles. We built um, different virtual cameras that could basically track the camera position. You're holding a camera and you're walking around, but what you're seeing is actually not what the camera is seeing. What you're seeing is what the computer camera is seeing. 
but you're able to move in that world, in the virtual world, and then our software takes the tracking of the camera, uh, we render that world using Game Engine Unity. What our tools do is handle the film part. So we make things go at the rate of film, we control time, simulate cameras, we simulate physics, and then we have these camera tracking devices where the virtual camera is sent and different people can see the world from their own angle. And very basically, you can film your movie virtually using these tools. This isn't limited to pre-production or previs, you could also do this on set. These new uh, methods are gonna totally revolutionize everything. Spoiler alert, Rachel <laughs> comes back. Very iconic from the original Blade Runner. The shape of the lips, uh, the sharpness of the corners here, shape of the eyebrows and the distance here, these are all very subtle things. It's really difficult to do, to create a digital human, and especially one to match someone that you know the likeness of. You know, she was very striking in that movie and very memorable. And uh, we, we were initially, we, we were confident we would be able to recreate her, but then we found out they were gonna actually show the original footage right before. So then we were terrified. This is a wonderful crew gift we got for Perfect Storm. And one of the really nice features about it is when you put a, a light behind it, you can see the translucency of the water. This is a single frame of the test shot for Perfect Storm. No one's seen this shot. It was never released. Uh, but this is where I was able to develop the shader for the ocean and be able to apply the different kinds of foam and uh, what we call the capillaries, the, the fine waves. And all of these colors that you can see is what we observed on real references of stormy seas, of how, what color the ocean was and what color the sky and the fog and haze went. When I started working on Perfect Storm, besides studying oceans and all the, all the stormy seas and natural effects we had to create, we also needed to create a digital ship. One of the key features of these fishing uh, boats was the fact that uh, the hull is so deep. In the beginning when I was doing the boat simulations, the boat kept coming out of the water and flying off the waves. And it wasn't until I made the, the hull deep enough and added the drag for the water that then it would just stick into the, in the water the way it should. Uh, so you just learn a lot about things if you draw them or, or build, build duplicates of it. It was a very fun project. One of the shots in Twister, we got, you got these, the barn and then the scale of this tornado with all the debris. We had a lot of reference for Twister, so we, we knew what to match, or we knew what the people were expecting. We didn't use any blue screen in the entire film. It was all uh, either hand rotoed and, and hand masked and, and hand tracking the cameras, all by hand. There was no match move software back then to track cameras automatically. Sometimes the fences would be practical, where they would be ejected. John Fraser's team, uh, uh, practical effects, they would have these things rigged, and other times we would have uh, digital ones. It all had to be blended together. Star Wars Episode One: all the motion of the pods and how they move and how they crash uh, was all something we set up using simulation. This is Sebulba pod crashing uh, into the dune and then the engine coming apart, and we had to develop uh, systems for every piece being simulated. This is actually going 800 miles an hour in the software. It's interesting how life works that way. You just uh, go through experiences and not realizing where it might lead you, but then when you get there, then it all makes sense that all the pieces were kind of leading you to some place. As we were shooting Dr. Shragi's story in Miami, I mentioned that Habib Zagarpur would be part of the film too. For a moment, Adrian was quiet before he said, I knew Habib. We were friends back in Iran. I met him for a walk right before we left Tehran. 
At that moment, I realized these two stories were not random at all. Not intentionally, I had put together two long lost friends in one film without knowing anything about that story. The next step was to organize a reunion for them. A Skype call after 41 years of no contact whatsoever. Hi, Abid. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> 42 years. You know, you actually, I'm, I'm still recognizing your features, which is awesome. <laughs> Just before I left Iran, right? Yeah, that was 42 years ago. I think it was probably two days before you left because we, we walked together, I remember. We walked together one evening. So that was, that must have been December 1979, right? I remember looking at our house before leaving. It was nighttime for some reason. The flight was nighttime. I remember looking at the house and having a very strange feeling that I'm not going to see it ever again. Uh, we were young at the time. How, how old you were? We were 15. It was very young. 17, you know, 16. 15, yeah, 16. Like that. Yeah, it was just felt like it was a big time of chaos, <clears throat> lots of things going on. And then, of course, uh, after I left, uh, there was a lot of uh, Baha'is that were captured, thrown in jail. So, um, uh, my own uncle was, uh, you know, suffered for many years, and then, uh, you know, it, it was difficult times, and it, it kind of accelerated really quickly. So I think we were we were lucky to um, uh, to be able to start somewhere else, but at the same time. All those who stayed were very steadfast and had to deal with a lot of consequences. So I always wonder how my life would be different um, if I was still there. It's really odd. Like Adrian and Habib, many people left the country during those years. Hundreds of thousands of Baha'is stayed and endured harassment, persecutions and difficulties. Nonetheless, their spirits were never broken. For every new prison, every hardship and tribulation the Baha'is in Iran had to endure, a new wave of constructive resilience took over the hearts of the friends. An ever-growing desire to serve the country they so much love and respect. For every drop of blood spilled in Iran, a new tree of hope was being planted on the most remote areas of the globe. For every sacrifice made for the betterment of the world, one more neighborhood in a small village in Asia, Africa or the Americas was being opened to the message of the divine educator Baha'u'llah, who was born in Iran and whose sole aim was to unify all the peoples of the world under one same banner of love and fellowship. <laughs>